Good evening. Welcome to the second installment of Westminster College's B.W. Bastion Foundation Diversity Lecture Series for the 2020-21 academic year. In a few moments, we will hear from our illustrious roster of speakers for tonight's subject, LGBTQIA students, identity, politics, and climate. I'm Dr. Tamara Stevenson. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I serve as the Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Chief Diversity Officer, and Associate Professor of Communication at Westminster College in Salt Lake City, Utah. I'm glad to welcome each and every one of you, including students, alums, staff, faculty, and campus leadership, along with community partners, colleagues, and friends from near and far to this event, now in a virtual format which has become part of our new way of co connecting. I'm sure all you all have other options to spend your time this evening. However, you've chosen to be with us. And for that, I thank you. Uh, let's recognize our presenting sponsor, the B.W. Bastion Foundation, which supports local and national institutions that benefit, encourage, and preserve the rights of individuals promote equality for the LGBTQ plus community and support HIV AIDS programs. On behalf of the college, I'd like to thank the BW Bastion Foundation for their longtime partnership with Westminster to make this diversity lecture series possible. Also, I extend gratitude to the following organizations for their partnering sponsorships of our diversity lecture series, along with the Bastion Foundation, including Cigna, Zions Bank and Jones Waldo. At this time, I acknowledge Utah's indigenous populations, the Goshoot, Diné, Paiute, Shoshone, and Ute peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging these communities, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. We acknowledge their stewardship of Utah's lands through many generations. Before we begin, starting with introductions of our speakers and moderators, a few housekeeping details. To ensure that the event goes smoothly, please mute your audio and use the Q&A function to post your questions. The chat function will be used to message relevant information going forward, and this event is being recorded for archival purposes. So coordinating this diversity lecture series is one of the many highlights of my job because I get to meet and learn from people who are doing amazing things in the name and action of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm especially honored and excited about this event because I happen to know all three speakers personally. In fact, two of the three speakers, Dr. Ebony Zamani Gallagher and Dr. Devika Deba Chaudhry were my doctoral advisors at Eastern Michigan University more than 15 years ago. In this type of academic relationship, as much as they were guiding me in discovering my scholarly identity, I got to learn about their scholarly interests. I immediately saw and learned of their foundational commitment to a student-centered, student-focused of agen agenda of research and practice to speak truth to power where there was a void in the research literature about LGBTQIA students. And then to meet Dr. Jason Taylor at the University of Utah and learn that we know some of the same people and we share some of the same scholarly interests and that just enriches my academic community. So in other words, this trio has been thinking about and critiquing the academy about this for more than a little while. And their most recent iteration of their thinking is manifested in this book, Rethinking LGBTQIA Students and Collegiate Contexts, Identity Policies and Campus Climate. And this is the very first time that all three co-editors are together to discuss this work. And so when I asked if they would speak for my institution's diversity lecture series, they showed up. They showed up for the work, but they also showed up for me. And I'm eternally thankful for their academic love and support. And I think they got a good return on their investment. I hope you all think so too. So thank you. So in the practice 
that I learned from my mentors about student involvement. Tonight's speaker introductions and Q&A session will be conducted by students from Queer Compass, a student-run, institutionally supported group through the college's Student Diversity and Inclusion Center that serves the LGBTQ plus population on our campus. Katie Valdez is a justice studies major in her fourth year at Westminster. Katie uses she, her, hers pronouns. Zoe Corianis is a justice studies major in her third, in their third year. Zoe uses they, them pronouns. Faith Staley is a justice studies major in their third year and the Queer Compass Program Coordinator with the Student Diversity and Inclusion Center. They use they, she pronouns. And Dodge Hovermail is a third year philosophy student and uses they, he pronouns. Students, thank you for being here and for introducing tonight's speakers. Take it away. Who's starting? Okay, sorry, just had to make sure it was me. Hey. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Danika Diva Chaudhry serves as a professor in the counseling program at Eastern Michigan University in Ypsilanti, Michigan, a licensed professional counselor, national certified counselor, approved clinical supervisor, and certified EMDR therapist. She has 20 years of clinical experience with refugees immigrant and multicultural populations, as well as trauma survivors on violence, sexuality, grief, and loss. Her research focuses on multicultural issues in psychotherapy, supervision, and pedagogy, with over 30 journal articles and chapters, and 50 national and international presentations. She served as the chair of the National Board of Certified Counselors and is currently president of the International Association for Specialists in Group Work. Dr. Jason L. Taylor is an assistant professor in the Department of Educational Leadership and Policy at the University of Utah. He received his PhD in higher education from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign with a research specialization in evaluation methods and con concentration in public policy. His scholarship investigates how higher education policies shape educational opportunities for marginalized and underrepresented college students particularly in the community college sector. Dr. Taylor has conducted and led several quantitative and mixed method studies related to college readiness, developmental education, college affordability, adult pathways to college, dual credit enrollment and early college experiences, transfer policy and reverse transfer, degree reclamation, LGBTQ plus students and educational access and equity. The goal of his research is to examine and better understand how public policies affect underserved students' access to, transition through, and success in community colleges and institutions of higher education to contribute to both theory and practice. Dr. Taylor has authored many research and evaluation reports, and he has published in journals such as American Behavioral Scientist, Community College Review, the Community College Journal of Research and Practice, Education Policy Analysis Archives, Higher Education Handbook of Theory and Research, and the Review of Higher Education. Dr. Taylor's research is informed by his experiences as a first-generation college graduate and his professional experience working in institutional and policy contexts as an advisor and registrar. Dr. Ebony M. Zamani Gallagher is Professor of Higher Education, Community College Leadership, and Director of the Office for Community College Research and Leadership. She previously served as Associate Head of the Department of Education Policy, Organization, and Leadership, and Associate Dean of the Graduate College at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. 
She serves as the executive director of the Council for the Study of Community Colleges. Samani Gallagher holds a PhD in higher education administration with a specialization in community college leadership and educational evaluation from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Her teaching, research, and consulting activities largely include psychosocial adjustment and transition of marginalized collegians, transfer, access policies, student development, and services at community colleges. Her research has been published in various journals and scholarly texts, including Equity and Excellence in Education, Higher Education Policy, New Directions for Community Colleges, and Teachers College Record. She has authored and co-authored and edited and co-edited edited eight books, which include Rethinking LGBTQIA Students and Collegiate Contexts, Identity, Policies, and Campus Climate, Working with Students in Community Colleges, Contemporary Strategies for Bridging Theory, Research, and Practice. ASHE, Readers on Community Colleges, 4th Edition, and the Obama Administration on Educational Reform. Speakers, whenever you're ready. Well, all right. Good evening, Westminster. Thank you so much for having us. Dr. Stevenson, thank you so much for the warm invitation and uh, the heartfelt love as it is reciprocal from um, us to you. I'm very proud of you, uh, academic family, and you're representing well. So with that, I just like to say um, we are really excited to have this evening with you. Um, we want to give you a little bit of a, a backdrop into uh, how we got into uh, this work, how we enter this space within the work, um, and to share um, some highlights around our most recent efforts with uh, the text Rethinking LGBTQIA uh, Students in Collegiate Context. Um, so as Dr. Stevenson noted, um, you know, we all have some, some great familiarity, um, one with another. Uh, Dr. Chaudhry and I uh, go back two decades now, and Dr. Taylor, who's my academic brother from another mother, we go back, Jason, we're, we're getting up there. We go back nearly as long. Definitely um, one decade, we can say. Yeah. <laughs> right, but we're over that, man. We're over that. You're edging in. We we're, we're probably got like a 15-year anniversary coming up, but um, that said, um, this has been such an enriching um, opportunity uh, for us to collaborate and one that's very organic. Um, you know, much of this started uh, fairly early on in terms of a couple different conversations. Uh, Deba and I had been talking about, and um, I had been wrestling with and, and sharing with her, um, you know, having uh, felt that there was such a dearth of, of attention uh, paid to LGBTQ folk uh, in community college settings, and and largely not because I was actually very aware um, at the time, but because I had an advisee who had witnessed um, what was a refusal, if not you know minimally a reduction in in care um, in terms of wraparound support services for a student who was openly uh, out and and was seeking some advisement. Um, that having bothered me, I tried to put together some resources around. Um, you know, student support services, wraparound services for um, for LGBTQ students in community college context. And at the time only came across like two articles. And I thought, you got to be kidding me. So in conversation with Deba and Passy, um, we then began to um, do some work um, that was uh, kind of newfangled at the time, because again, it was it was an under-researched area. Separately from that, Jason and I have been having conversations and have overlap within our community college research community uh, and, and been talking with one another found that this too was just another area um, that we were like, okay, this could be synergistic. Um, we all have concerns. We all feel that there's a need to make a knowledge college contribution. And so that's how the three of us um, got together with our, our little love triangle here for this work, because we, we definitely, this is a, a heart matter for us. We know that sexuality is an important aspect of, uh, of adult life. 
we know that there's a lot of uh, awareness that is needed in terms of greater awareness regarding LGBTQIA um, adult learners within um, college and university campuses across institutional type, both two-year, four-year, public, private, research one environment, small liberal art private institutions that we just don't know or not know enough, though we know some of the issues, there's just not been a lot of areas of research that have delved uh, deeper, um, particularly with respect to um, issues around um, problematizing, contextualizing, situating um, the importance and nuances of context, as well as student development and identity. And so um, as we um, sought to endeavor um, creating some work, but the work also about um, infusing the, the um, you know, existing literature with um, how to foster opportunities, how to create strategies, how to inform practice, um, how to shape policies um, to make sure that we are um, helping to have not hostile hallways or chilly campus climates, but those that would um, definitely be embracing truly inclusive um, and provide equitable student experiences and outcomes for a diverse um, array of students um, as there is much intersectionality and multiplicity of self for uh, LGBTQIA collegians. So with that said, um, as we, you know, uh, moved into, um, you know, the work and, and was very careful of, and, and intentional um, in this work about um, seeking um, scholars who uh, have a criticality um, about the work in, in such a way where we wanted to, one, um, not just, you know, talk about and pontificate about issues, but to provide more than just knowledge and awareness, but to um, poke folks to have the dispositions as well as take action around um, practitioner leadership, activist leadership, um, you know, beyond allyship um, to advocacy and accompliship with um, helping um, to, to foster these enriching, positive, engaging post-secondary contexts uh, across the spectrum of difference for LGBTQ students. Um, and so we have three sections to the text, um, the, the first of which really kind of situates and, and it kind of um, kind of speaks to, we, we revisit um, the term rethinking. Um, because it is a revisiting and it is a way of re-envisioning, right, what we feel would be more ideal context and, again, challenging um, folk to take a greater look and to underscore what could be the opportunities and the possibilities. So with section one, it's the LGBTQIA uh, identity and rethinking the identity. Uh, we have within that segment of the text um, chapters by date uh, by Dr. Uh, Kate Curley, uh, along with uh, our truly uh, Dr. Childry, that looks at the multiplicity of identity and issues of intersectionality, as well as a chapter on intersex and the shape of of sex and gender, because um, that's something that again has not received um, the attention that it should. Uh, and then within that section two, we look at kinship um, in relationship to gender and student services, um, and particularly those services wraparounds in terms of a dialogic way of centering um, trans narratives. And then um, kind of rounding that out is, again, a piece that, that really talks about that multiple aspects of self is exploring identities uh, and experiences of LGBTQIA um, students with disabilities. So I'm going to actually turn it over to Jason at this point, and he could share a little bit more of some highlights from the text from um, the second segment of the book. Thanks, and uh, uh, good evening, Westminster community. I, uh, uh, I think many of us are in the same, same geographic location here, so it's a little. I wish I, I wish we could join you in person, but it's it's wonderful to spend a few minutes um, uh, or the evening with you uh, virtually. So and and thanks for the invitation and kudos to all the students who are who are leading um, and and part of this conversation tonight. I really respect and admire 
the decision to have uh, students really right at the um, involved in this. So the second section is uh, uh, is about context, and one of as as Ebony mentioned, you know, we have been having conversations about, um, and particularly with our work in the two year context. Um, you know, we really don't know a lot uh, from the literature and research um, on, on queer students. And so, you know, what we really know, a lot of the literature for decades has been, you know, uh, in the context of a white four year cis um, context. And so we wanted to think about both sort of the institutional context but also other ways to, to sort of uh, uh, rethink contexts, if you would. So um, one of the contexts that, um, you know, is in the chapter is on community colleges, which, you know, thinks about uh, how, how um, different contexts within community colleges in, influence queer students, um, thinks about ideas such as home place, uh, um, where, you know, what, what home means to, stu to queer students. Uh, we have another con institutional context, uh, uh, a chapter on institutional context about HBCUs. Um, Steve Mobley and his colleagues um, really talk about the role of uh, HBCUs um, not addressing queer students and um, offers some really, uh, really um, important stories of both resistance and resilience for for. HBCUs and, and as well as some, you know, some really insightful uh, ways in which uh, HBCUs are bringing queer students into, um, into their work in, in terms of uh, leadership roles, um, wellness programs that are that account for both sort of a, a queer and a black student identity. Then there's a chapter on um, classroom context which, uh, you know, I think um, the gr student groups uh, are, and student organizations are so important to the life, uh, to student life for queer students and LGBTQIA students. But, um, you know, students always don't always show up in the ways that we design um, uh, experiences for them outside of the classroom. And so this chapter really looks at, you know, what we know about, um, LGBTQIA identity and their experiences in class in the classroom space and um, offer some ways to sort of help help um, uh, move beyond uh, traditional pedagogies in, in the classroom space for queer students. And then finally, the last chapter is uh, you know, sort of a, a intersection of identity and context to some extent, which focuses on asexuality and uh, students with that identity, but it really thinks about ideas of invi invis invisibility and erasure. So a context in which students uh, feel like they're invisible and in which, um, you know, some queer students actually, or asexual students really feel like they're being erased, um, intentionally erased and sort of helps us think about, um, as Ebony sort of mentioned, you know, sort of um, problematizing some of the ways in which we sometimes unintentionally and sometimes intentionally erase um, or or um, students exist in this context of, of invisibility. So uh, all of that being, you know, context matters uh, to to students' experiences and to how they how they um, you know how they make sense of and how they sort of uh, be, if you will, in in a in a college environment. So with that, I'll kick it over to Diva, who's gonna talk about the, the last section of the book. Okay, <laughs> um, I'm gonna start. Hi, everybody. I'm gonna start with just sort of saying, um, I'm Diva Choudhury, I use she, her, hers pronouns. Um, and uh, after Ebony said, um, two decades, I felt really old. Um, <laughs> I identify, um, I feel that over these years, um, and particularly as I look at uh, students, um, I simultaneously am in awe and admiration of what you're grappling with now, but I sort of feel like over the years, I've kind of been through each of those struggles um, 
And so I identify as an international middle-class, middle-aged, queer, cis mother of color. And um, all of those have been built over the years. I remember I'm old enough to when it was a gay and lesbian movement. And then the bisexuals came in and everybody said, oh no, what are you doing here? And then, um, and then trans folk said, but this is the community we feel at safe in. And, you know, everyone who is gay, lesbian, bisexual said, no, no, you're just, you know, or some of the same things that had been said about um, bisexuals of you're just, you're just passing, you're selling out, you're sitting on the fence, you're doing all that. Um, and then it was LGBT and then um, it continued and uh, a joke lately is, um, you know, I keep asking people what LGBT are, um, LGBT, I, S, 2S, 2Q um, stands for and I can never get a straight answer. But, um, so a lot of this, one of the things that I think is profoundly um, important about Ebony that is her unwavering commitment to truth and justice. And so it was an advisee who raised the issue and took it up and, and made it her business to learn it, to know it, to study it. And, and I think um, that was so inspiring because I'd been, as a, as a therapist, working with clients who um, presented with various issues around gender and sexuality, but um, being able to do qualitative research with queer people of color um, and to, to do all that, I really owe to Ebony. So, so that's sort of my piece. Um, the, other, the other thing I just want to say is that both the terribleness and the beauty of COVID is that I'm not where you are. And um, I'm in Michigan where um, it's the land of the three fires of the Chippewa, Odawa, and Potawatomi. And those are the indigenous peoples um, of, of this land. Um, so in the third section of the book, we really moved into thinking about, so given these ways of reimagining um, context and identity, how would we rethink policy and possibility in terms of responses to that? And uh, the, the chapters in there uh, really sort of problematize within those various identities. So uh, Paul Eaton has one on challenging complicity and institutional racism from the perspective of white queer academics. Um, there's uh, envisioning possibilities for transformative change in post-secondary education, where it's trickle up policy building by Carrie Dachendorf, Megan Natney and Z. Um, and then one which um, Kate Curley was my co-author and they have an exquisite and very complicated piece on trans quant crit, which is an invitation to higher education quantitative researchers to uh, look at um, transgressive and trans uh, quantitative critique, just like critical race theory to think about it from the perspective of non-binary and gender fluid perspectives. And then uh, Diane's choir uh, sort of looking at ending allies. Um, and the best way I can sort of frame some of that is, um, you know, for a long time, we thought of people who took care of other people as just really caring people until we sort of began to think about caretaking as ways of enabling and how much being an ally enables systems to continue because it makes them just tolerable enough. And so, um, so yes, so that's the final piece. Thank you for giving us an overview of, of, the, of the text and the 
you know, background and the experiences and the situations you encountered that compelled you to act, to, to not only find information to support students, but you, what you've done is just is open up again this void uh, that that had existed, but there was nothing in it or or nothing of quality maybe to to inform this work. So my first question, or one question that I have is, what were some surprising and or aha moments you encountered as you were compiling this text? Now that can be a, a springboard to to you know, wherever direction we can, we'd like to go in tonight again with our students as well. Well, I guess I'll, I'll just uh, quickly share. Um, I guess in terms of a surprise was um, from the, you know, again, initial conversations. And I, and I want to say it may have been um, maybe 2006, seven, somewhere in there. Um, and I think there were two articles that, you know, came across one, which was almost like a, a call for research, right? And then the other, which was a, a study. And again, I'm thinking about the community college in terms of context at that time, um, because the student that I was advising was a student affairs administrator, um, um, at, at a community college, um. Anyhow, there was a piece that was a quantitative survey piece. So then you fast forward a um, couple years and it's maybe around 2010. And there's lots of work again, as Jason mentioned, uh, four year centric though. Um, and again, the, the, the surprise was, okay, uh, we still haven't had anybody. So if, it's, if, if, if someone's gonna create um, work in this area, then I guess we're going to have to go ahead and do it because we just kind of were like, well, maybe somebody will do something and they hadn't, <laughs> you know, um, so it was just like, all right, so let's do this. Um, but again, it's been about 10 years since, um, you know, Chris Wren, actually, we were fortunate to, to have Chris write the, the forward for the book. And, you know, and you talk about having some incredible bookends. I know recently you had D.L. Stewart um, to uh, be one of the Bastion um, lecturers, right? Um, and DL did the afterward, right? And you're talking about fire, right? In terms of uh, what a way to nest all of these wonderful contributions from the chapter authors. But again, the surprise that we still had a dearth of, of attention paid to particular contexts and a particular queer folk. Um, you know, it's been at least a decade since there has really been calls that we need additional research around diverse populations within the LGBTQIA communities, um, as well as the, the college campuses that um, they're at. Um, and, you know, so that was the surprise that we were still, still there, um, having very little in the way of, of certain evidence about what we can do to improve and have folk thrive across community. Mm -hmm. um, let me think. Uh, I think probably for me, one of the most uh, interesting um, and surprising pieces was uh, that exploration of both home and homelessness and the, the issue of finding home and where do you find it and sometimes the act of finding new homes means acknowledging homelessness in the first place hmm. uh, I think that um, what personally surprised me was uh, particularly I think people now that uh, how fluid <clears throat> transitional and necessary, the act of making meaning about an, one's name is. Um, that it's extremely important. And I think one of the things that um, people my age uh, sometimes think is, well, if it transitions so much, if it can shift, then it's not that important. In fact, I think it's even more important because the very shifting nature of it is 
is an integral part of naming oneself. So, so that was that was one of my learning pieces, I think, um, through this of not taking anything for granted uh, that it, but to but to hear where people are and that that's a fluid place. Um, uh, I you know I think one of the ahas for me in this process is, um, and I, I try to practice this in, in my teaching, but um, it really comes through in this book because we did sort of think, take such an intersectional approach is that you, um, you know, it's really, it's really difficult to understand the world and make sense of, um, of students and college students, queer college students, in you know, with one or two frameworks, um, and it's just not possible. And many a times, I think you know, we are couched in our own experience, and so we, in our own, our own life experiences, our own, um, uh, as faculty, our own sort of frameworks that drive you know how how we write, what we do, um, as practitioners, um, student affairs leaders who you know, um, have a certain way of leading and uh, a certain way of, of making change happen on campus um, that, you know, it's, you know, I think, uh, you know, reading, stepping outside of your own shoes. And in this case, you know, we, there are so many, I would say, non, uh, so many non-traditional identities that we sort of wrestle with in this, um, in this text that the authors, the chapter authors wrestle with that um, it's really, it's really just, I think, clear that um, we have to think in so many, uh, from so many different um, theoretical and conceptual perspectives to understand not just what we, you know, what students are experiencing, but how we need to really um, offer multiple uh, multiple ways for students to thrive, for queer LGBTQIA, LGBTQIA students to thrive on campus. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna, I think one of the questions was about uh, Ahmed's 2006 um, queer phenomenology. And I think that that's really helpful to consider here because it thinks about, she argues essentially that the spaces we inhabit are not exterior to our bodies, that spaces are like a second skin. The social has a skin, a border that feels, um, I think that it's shaped by the impressions left by others. And so these deviant spaces that are queer, that are black, that are uh, in some way transgressive, um, that how to create space for that so that they are not made invisible. And um, I think that's a struggle um, constantly, um, both seeking to honor um, content and, and in some ways uh, for me, you know, I, I teach graduate students in counseling and some of the counseling texts while while very um, relevant, are very binary, you know, like incredibly binary. And so how do I teach in a way that allows students to hear the content without essentially being, um, being silenced by it, to be able to engage with it and, and then transform it so that it is a revisioning of it rather than it has to be in the junk heap of history because it can't speak to me at this point. And so part of, I think for me as faculty is to be that translational space between content that some of it is, is inherently oppressive because it's produced. I mean, and some of my you know old writings are, are quite within those frames that um, I'd be really embarrassed about now. And unfortunately they're in publication, so have to be embarrassed. Um, 
Uh, but but to be able to invite students into a space that is more liberatory so that they can engage um, on more equal terms. And I think, so I think for me, that's, that's as kind of as much as I can, I'm trying to do. You know, I, can I just touch real quick on, there was a question I saw pop up a, a little bit ago about um, mis, mis uh, pronouns and misgendering. Yep. Mm -hmm. and kind of connected to what you were just sharing i think some of that um also has to um deal with um the pedagogy right in terms of um how a faculty member is um because certainly misgendering can can occur um deliberate in a deliberate fashion and then there's ways in which it you know it's not on someone's frontal lobe or radar but just because um there wasn't an intent to harm or hurt doesn't mean that they're exempt from the impact of, right. of how that lands and, and how that's received. And so, mm -hmm. you know, um, some of what you said about um, being conscious and, and, and trying to have some intentionality um, with res respect to some of the, the readings that you're pushing back on just the traditional canon and seeking to create ways, even though it takes more effort, right, on your part, to queer the curriculum, so to speak, right? Because you're you're trying to to, to um, have students feel affirmed in the curriculum, have um, them think about too, and that you welcome it because all faculty don't, right? And um, mm -hmm. how you might um, challenge differential um, kind of identities in terms of the normative identities of mm -hmm. that that gender binary versus something that's more gender fluid in, in, in class. So I think, um, you know, the question about, well, how do we, you know, deal with faculty that are that are doing that? And, and I guess, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that we got to educate our colleagues more. Um, there's still, I think, a lack of of training, if you will, about what does it mean when a person identifies, um, whether it's trans, um, whether it's, you know, um, gender non-conforming, you know, whatever it is, but that, um, especially when it comes to pronouns, right, in the, in the form of how people are addressed, mm -hmm. something as simple as telling folks to, what, what would you prefer? What is your preferred pronoun? Mm -hmm. Or what is your preferred nickname? And, and things of that nature. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's a simple thing that folks can devote themselves to doing uh, that can make a, um, a big difference to a lot of folks. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this, this semester, and I deeply apologize that I d never did it before, but this semester as I was over the summer putting my syllabi together, I decided I needed to put in a statement into my syllabi and so um, one of them says, every student in this course is a valued member. You enrich us all with your intersecting identities of race, ethnicity, culture, gender, religion, class, national origin, sexual and affectional orientations, ability, age, background, political affiliation, or any other identification. In this course, you have the right to determine your own identity. You have the right to be called by whatever name you wish and for that name to be pronounced correctly. You have the right to be referred to by whatever pronoun you identify and you have the right to adjust identifications at any point. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because like about half the students don't know what to make of that because they're like, what, what is this? Why is this in the syllabus? And, and about half my students are sort of like, oh, thank gosh. <laughs> but the, the half that don't know what to do with it, you know, like, right? What's that whole thing about one-way dominance functions is by remaining unexamined. And so the extent to which they haven't had to explore those intersections or, again, um, have the privilege of what is thought of as the normative gender, um right and yeah. i i think of the word you know unlearn unlearning right and the process of unlearning and i think we've all you know been socialized and grown up in a pretty binary context um 
and, and, and world. And I think this applies to, to faculty, right? Who are faculty and staff who, you know, this, um, we'll let the sp students can probably speak to this, you know, like um, it's particularly this generation is, you know, is, you know, has, has grown up in a world that's less binary than what we grew up in. Um, and so, so there's that, that dimension, but I think, you know, for, for faculty and staff, we have to unlearn and um, just sort of how we unlearn, uh, you know, as we expand our scholarship and we expand our teaching, you know, um, I think we need to unlearn the ways that we uh, you know, think in, in this binary, binary world and how even the simple things sometimes, as Ebony said, that are, you know, unintentional, but, and some, but sometimes intentional um, can have really harmful effects um, on, on queer students. Mm -hmm. um, I, the, actually, Ebony, do you want to take the one, the question from Brian? Before, before that, uh, yeah. Dodge has been waiting with a question. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think this was mentioned in Jason's section and like the second section of the book, but you mentioned um, moving beyond traditional pedagogies. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that and what that looks like um, and like how you imagine that moving forward. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll respond and uh, I'm sure Ebony and Diva probably um, please jump in here too. Uh, well, so I think that I mean, there's some, there's a lot of things that I think we just don't think about uh, in, in the classroom space. Um, and so uh, one of them is, you know, who, um, you know, who do we, who's represented in our, uh, in our, on our syllabi and who's, who's not represented on our syllabi, um, uh, both from a uh, you know, a gender and sexual identity perspective from a racial perspective, I mean, a racial identity perspective. So um, I don't, we're not trained to create syllabi in that way, right, as, as faculty, we're not trained to sort of bring our content together um, in, you know, base in, in that way. So, so that's, that's one example. Um, there's, I think, lots of other, I mean, uh, lots of other examples around uh, what I think are basic sort of inclusive teaching practices um, that, you know, I think work for um, all different types of marginalized identities. Um, so they, you know, things like, um, you know, asking students before class starts, you know, what do you, you know, what matters to you um, in this class, you know, what do I need to know about you as a faculty member that's going to help me understand how you learn and what you're bringing to um, this learning experience and then actually using that to, um, you know, to sort of um, develop the best learning environment uh, for students. Um, you know, we, we only have in that the chapter that uh, uh, I actually wrote that chapter in the book that addresses um, sort of the classroom space. We've got actually have a you know, we have a decent amount of some literature on the role of identity and the classroom space, but we have a lot more on what happens outside of the classroom. Um, and so that chapter sort of reviews what, what we know in the classroom. But, um, and one of the things that's also, I think, that emerged from that review and that's relevant for teaching is um, what, what you see is how faculties, um, either gender uh, or sexual orientation, you know, matters for particularly for queer students um, uh, for their own learning and development. So sometimes I think we like to take as faculty, we might um, remove our identity from the classroom, remove our personal lives from the classroom. But for some students, you know, and particularly the, the, let's go back to context, right? Um, you could say commuter institutions, um, maybe not so much Westminster, your residential institution, but um, you know, sometimes some students, their main prime, their primary experience on in college is in the classroom context. So they might not have time to join a student group. Um, so bringing your identity into the classroom as a either as a um, certainly as a someone who might identify as queer, um, it could be really important. But also, um, you know, all of the I think that the um, those who don't identify as queer. Um, 
you know, bringing your identity and acknowledging your identity as it relates to the learning process, I think can be super powerful. But I'll, Ebony, Diva, do you uh, want to weigh in on that? And it, it is super powerful and we don't get taught how to do it. You know, one of the things that often happens is that um, you get a PhD in your subject. And so then it's like, oh, well, then you know how to teach it. Mm -hmm. Not so much. Um, so knowing content and knowing the field is no guarantee of the teaching process. Um, and, and so um, I think it's optimistic to think that faculty members are lifelong learners. <laughs> Many of them are, um, but only in their field. And so you know, the social piece passes them by often. And um, I think increasingly students are, have much, are much more powerful than they, they have been in the past. Um, well, or maybe you just don't have to shout quite so loudly as, as it had to be in the past. But um, the thing is, just getting rid of them, sort of saying, oh, well, let's just fire them, doesn't change society. And ultimately, what we want is to transform the world, to be able to be nourishing and inclusive um, for everyone wherever we go, right? Not just in that ivory tower bubble, because what good is that? And so I would rather that students learn the tools to be able to advocate and assert and struggle for what needs to happen and change that needs to happen. So, um, yeah. so it sounds like you were touching on what Brian um, raised. And um, I mean, that's, a, that's a great question, um, Brian. I think some of the tension around, um, I think, well, uh, the question of, can you just dismiss folks or, you know, I guess what kind of recourse do you have? Because, yeah, I mean, some people are unwittingly, um, you know, doing this in terms of the, um, you know, misuse of pronouns, but there's, there is, and it's documented, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm sure this is what you're noting is um, there are some people that are intentionally kind of having this misattribution of, of gender. Um, and that they're doing so with the sole purpose as, you know, kind of like having this strategy of intimidation. Um, sometimes it's harassment, particularly with transgender persons. Um, mm -hmm. And so what you're saying, and I get what you're saying, but we also are not at a place where um, that has been adequately addressed in a critical fashion in terms of the courts, any kind of um, legal precedent, any kind mm -hmm. of scholarship within the legal community. There are some articles that have argued around some of that. I've seen a few like in terms of medicine and how misgendering mm -hmm. um, can be hurtful, can be harmful. I've seen a couple things in some legal outlets about um, you know, the extent to which if you have counsel or there's opposing parties, do you have a, a case for misconduct? Um, if, if you have somebody who um, is disparaging you um, as, as a, a trans person or gender binary person. Um, so, I mean, but the thing about professional conduct or rules for engagement with that, um, in terms of all practicality, you haven't caught up with, you know, even though it shouldn't be permissible, the solutions haven't caught up with the fact that um, we know this is not fair treatment. Um, we know this can be harmful, hurtful. We don't have an administration of justice in terms of legally to, to, to um, uh, have someone be dismissed from their employment um, based on you know, the way they kind of review language or, or think about it. But misgendering for some folks, um, you know, a good friend of mine, I mean, it's, it can be, um, if it, it feels, it's almost like a, um, a thousand little cuts, right? In terms of having a large impact and, and being harmful. And for some people, 
the, the negative outcomes or consequences of being on a receiving end of being misgendered and how that wears you down because mm -hmm. it's as if you're not seen and that your rights don't exist and you know misnaming as well mm -hmm. you know okay. so that if you know your birth name you know your government name is you know mm -hmm. not um how you identify and then you choose to you know have a, a different mm -hmm. um identity in terms of uh, name associated mm -hmm. and that folks still will you know uh do that you know yeah. so the long and short of it is mm -hmm. I, I get what you're saying but um yeah legally we th there's no recourse with that yet yeah and then i wanted to just add that um and it's more complicated right i have um a counselor that i supervise who's trans, who uses they, them pronouns, who is working with a client who is gender fluid and uses all pronouns. And in group supervision, we were talking about the client. And uh, so, you know, within a sentence, we, I was switching pronouns um, because I'd asked the counselor how they wanted to reference the client and they said um, if they wanted to just use they or do they wanted to use uh, fluid pronouns they said you know that's the client's preference to use fluid pronouns so i was using so i had used a different pronoun than the counselor did and someone else in the group sort of very sort of you know seriously said oh dr Chaudhry, you're misgendering that client and on the one hand I want students to speak up when they think that's happening. Um, and so I didn't want to sort of say, um, no, I'm not. And so you I had said, gender confirmation. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so I said, I'll I'll just um I'll I'll leave it to the counselor who's working with the client to to sort of uh discuss that, who then did. Um but but think about it in that context of legal how are you going to do that legally if and i do think the wave of the future is going to be fluidity is the norm and then if mm -hmm. people choose to be in any one place or in a binary place that's going to be the um you know uh alternative and so I don't know. Uh, that's no, more sorry. movement. Go ahead, Jason. No, I'm sorry. I thought you were finished. Yeah. I, I mean, I just in response to Brian's question, the only thing I'll add is I think, you know, when we see our colleagues doing things uh, in intentional and explicit ways, I think um, it's our responsibility mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, be critical. Um, of our colleagues and in a, in a, you know, in a way that's respectful, but I think, you know, um, back to sort of the idea of unlearning, I think, um, I, I still believe in people and think that, you know, even people who sometimes might, you know, sort of be explicit, um, we can still engage and develop, develop people, as you said, you know, they're lifelong learners. Um, so, but I think as faculty and staff, you know, we need to build coalitions to, to really support, um, support, support uh, you know, our, our students. You know, it just made me think about what the third section of the book, Jason, where mm -hmm. we get into possibilities and policies mm -hmm. that, that is an area where we really could use activist leadership so that part of what we do, if we want to um, have folks to be in campus environments that are gender fluid, that acknowledge folk um, and see folk um, as they are and who they are without misgendering them, the way to curtail language that's harmful to subordinated communities is to actually put that down right like to have within what is our professional code of conduct and how we evaluate and you know and be real clear about like how there's not tolerance um 
for justifications uh, for misgendering um, and that, mm -hmm. um, you know, we really don't have tolerance for, for folks, um, particularly in, intentionally um, doing so, right? Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, at Westminster, um, part of the Title IX protections, I believe, they've been extended to con like to cover gender-based discrimination based on like, transgender people and non-binary and non gender non-conforming identities. And I'm wondering if you feel, like, think that that's like a possibility in other places, or if that would like adequately um, address this issue. And maybe this is for participants as well. Was it you were saying with respect to gender in, um, in general, or was it with trans? Um, I like the general Title IX is against sex-based discrimination, right? But right. it has like adopted it to include um, transgender people. Okay. Specifically. Like, um, so that was originally the Obama administration um, expanded Title IX protections for gender identities as well, gender expansive identities, um, which of course we no longer have. Um, and so a lot of the restrictions, so it would be um, private colleges and universities um, who are actually also still being threatened if they receive federal funding um, you know, for doing any of that. Ebony, you are much more the scholar. Right. I mean, as you, well, yes and no, but you're right. Um, that was during the um, Obama um, administration in terms of the, the second, um, his second term. Um, and like many things that uh, President Obama did, um, we have a, a, a current occupant of the Oval Office that's been very committed to getting results. That's the opposite of that, <laughs> um, to dismantling that. And, and so um, we're at a place right now where um, we have some, some landmark Supreme Court rulings uh, around Title IX where, where um, just in the last less than two weeks where mm -hmm. um, the, the departments around in terms of the, the regs for Title IX, and that's why I was wanting to, to clear, kind of clarify. So back in the spring, I want to say it was like in, around May, there were um, LGBTQ advocacy organizations um, and, and folks in, in general, right, from the, the general public who were uh, attempting and concerned about the, the procedures um, to have, um, one, you got the issues around campus sexual misconduct that doesn't explicitly um, provide protections for homosexuals, for transgender, for LGBTQ. Then there was also issues around um, protections in terms of both um, gender uh, discrimination um, for LGBTQ. And so we, I think if in terms of student rights, we're still in a gray area um, based on where we were with what was new policy still um, through the Obama administration. Um, so as you have, there's some stuff around um, LGBTQ survival, survivors Title IX rights, right? And so it should protect all students Title, um, title IX, but particularly from sexual violence, irrespective of your gender, um, if you are the survivor of an alleged, um, you know, someone that has been a perpetrator that's tried to harm you, any kind of sexual assault, even if it's same gender, right, you have rights. Where it gets interesting is, is, you know, other instances where let's say you were bullied, physically assaulted, um, there's other things that's, that's happening um, where we get gray areas. Um, but there, as you know, an unacceptably high rate of, um, of, of harassment that happens, right? That violence even, mm -hmm. um, particularly going on in, in middle and secondary schools. Um, and so we still are at a place just in this month where we're hoping um, to, to get some clarification um, and with it being a, a five three right now with the courts, I'm I'm not quite sure 
Mm -hmm. um, what kind of protections are going to stay in place or what ex um, extensions of Title IX for transgender and gender nonconforming students we're going to have in terms mm -hmm. of Title IX rights? Yeah, so much of the highest rates of violence, trans women of color. Um, and, you know, but none of these groups are seen as quite American these days and so not deserving of protection. Uh, you know, and the most vulnerable of the vulnerable um, universities, many universities have set themselves up to be sanctuary spaces, whether it's undocumented students who are LGBTQ. Um, but, uh, but the other piece, and I don't know, uh, Tam, if we have time, but I did want to address a little bit of talking about COVID and how that has impacted um, specifically policy and practice. And, and Jason and I have, have thought about some of this stuff in terms of equity. Um, for policies and practices in, in terms of COVID. Uh, I don't know quite what, what had happened at Westminster, but you know, by and large, when the pandemic first hit, um, most universities and colleges sort of said, okay, for student safety, we're sending you all home. Well, that's a nice idea if people have a home or they have a home where they feel safe. Um, a home where they have resources and access, a home where they have some sense of community. And we know that so many LGBTQ students um, find sort of uh, the freedom to be able to do self-exploration and identity development once they get to college. And so to be sent home after that is, a, is such profound losses of community, of safety, of access, of resources, um, of health insurance. Uh, university and college settings, health insurance possibilities are so much more, um, well, I don't know about so much more, but a little bit more <laughs> inclusive and compassionate um, than sometimes the local, you know, pediatrician who's been seeing someone since they were, you know, two years old and refuses to talk about this gendering. Uh, so all of those kind of ways in which policies and practices did not think about equity adequately in just sort of thinking they were responding to public health. Jason, did you? Yeah, no, I mean, I think we could, we did a, we um, did a talk on this last week, and I think you hit on a lot of the points, um, but I think, you know, just, you know, the, uh, what, what our assumptions about what home is and how home works for which students need to be, you know, we need to, we need to really examine those assumptions critically because mm -hmm. um, uh, particularly for, for queer students, um, you know, yeah, a lot of them leave, you know, myself included, I was in the space, like I wanted to leave home, you know, that was, that was safety for me. So, you know, I think, um, you know, and I know recognizing so many, uh, you know, college leaders and, and, and faculty and staff had to make a lot of quick decisions in uh, just in unprecedented uh, circumstances. But, you know, that how are we thinking about that now? We sort of, we have adapted. So I think our, you know, sort of the call to action, you know, to really um, act, talk to our queer students. What do you, you know, how are you, you know, how can we help you thrive in, in this environment? And, um, and uh, you know, where, where home just, just isn't safe or might not be safe. Mm -hmm. uh, as our time is, is starting to wrap up a bit, I'd like to uh, kind of open the space a bit more if our students have a, a question they'd like to share with, with the panel. I have another one, but I already asked. So if anybody else wants to go first. <laughs> Uh, 
Okay, I can ask mine. Um, my question, and also it was one of the ones we got in the chat a little while ago, um, but where do you see the need for the most research going forward? Like in what area, same, um, like LGBTQIA plus studies, where do you think is the most important focus for the future? And keeping in mind that, you know, like you guys have mentioned, everything is always shifting. That's a great question. Well, for me, it's, it's, it's actually the, the IA part of it. Um, uh, while we still need more research on the lived experiences of uh, LGBTQ students, um, I still think we don't have enough relative yeah. to trans only. I mean, there's mm -hmm. there's been uh, more in, in the last handful of years, particularly Ni Nic uh, Z. Nicolazzo has done um, some phenomenal work in terms of um, her book on um, on trans in college um, with the stylus um, publications. Um, but beyond that, um, Brian Lackman, Amanda Millette, um, again, one of those areas that's been particularly untouched um, and not frontal lobe is, is talking about um, asexuality, mm -hmm. um, you know, or um, intersexuality, you know, with Kate's work, uh, and particularly um, students with disabilities um, mm -hmm. that are LGBTQIA um, and Amanda Bill, who's mm -hmm. at Purdue University, um, really kind of looking at um, queer theory and critical disability studies um, and doing some really um, interesting work um, and, mm -hmm. and looking at um, and problematizing what equity looks like um, in, in terms of intersectionality of, of identities with, with race and class mm -hmm. and gender and, and disability. So those for me, I think are areas that are still, there's very little out there and there's number mm -hmm. of space room and opportunity and we need more work um, in those areas. Yeah, I would agree that um, it's not even so much the data, but having a robust research methodology that can account for intersectionality. Um, you know, by centering around one salient identity, say of asexuality, but then framing it in the context of all of the other identities as well. Um, I don't think we have yet really done a good enough job on developing anything robust to assess that adequately. Um, and, and I am a qualitative researcher, but um, increasingly, I would really like to look at the interpersonal context. Um, so rather than an individual's lived experience, an individual in context, an interpersonal context lived experience, because otherwise, you know, we wouldn't go anywhere, we wouldn't get to know anybody and we wouldn't change. <laughs> But if we do change and we change an interaction and relationship with others, then we have to account for the impact of those relationships. I mean, one of the interesting things, you know, is that when Dr. Stevenson sort of opened out your diversity lecture, she talked about relationship and relationship as um, transformative. And I think that um, we haven't studied that effectively enough. Yeah, I, I agree with, with both of those. And I think um, one, uh, one place I think we need to know more, we need some more research on is, well, let me give you this example. So I think our, you know, right now we've got what I probably, those, the students who are part of the Queer Compass group and uh, you know, those of you who are you know, probably tuning into this, it's sort of like, this is the choir, I'm guessing. Um, so I, I don't know that, that's an assumption, but that's not, um, that's not uncommon when we offer professional development events in higher education for faculty and staff. And uh, when, you know, for students, right, we, we create student groups, we create centers and um, identity centers, and um, we, we tend to study those professional development events and people who 
uh, for faculty and staff and for students who go to the identity centers. But what do we know about everyone else who's not really um, thinking, talking, and engaging on um, sort of uh, queer identity uh, issues on campus? And I think, you know, we need more research on, you know, you know why they aren't and what, how do they think and what, um, uh, what do, you know, um, what do we, you know, why aren't you engaging and what, how can we, um, uh, how can we learn from sort of those who don't engage and participate to inform what we need to do? I have uh, one more question for you all. Um, so sort of touched on earlier, but um, you talked about the limitations of being an ally. And I was wondering how exactly you're defining that term and what we see is like the, I don't know, the, the vision beyond being an ally. Okay. Well, um, you yeah, Okay, you go. <laughs> no, you go, you go, you go. You sure? <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, well, I, I kind of think about it in terms of uh, this continuum where allyship for me is, is like the base level, right? It's, it's kind of an entry point. Um, allies, and in many respects, while, um, you know, you have folks that uh, kind of uh, can empathize, may um, want to even advocate, right, on behalf of that there's ways in which you can still be complicit um, in not moving the needle forward uh, for marginalized and minoritized and underserved populations by solely being an ally. Um, I kind of think about allyship akin to, let's say, you know, gen ed, right? <laughs> There's gen ed requirements, um, some of which are core classes, some of which um, are electives, right? There's some things that are non-negotiable. You are required to take. Um, and I think when people um, have what has been a subordinated um, identity, and I think uh, earlier I said, you know, one way dominance functions is by remaining unexamined. Right. Jason Katz talks about that. He's a sociologist. So um, all of us have this multiplicity uh, and aspects of self. Um, and so we have a foot within um, both privileged communities and those that have been subordinated ones. And I think sometimes often, you know, allies, again, are are coming in with these kind of privileged identities um, and that they have the luxury. Right. Uh, to also kind of opt out if you will, where, um, you know, maybe today, you know, I've, I've had folks who's like, you know, I don't want to deal with racism today. I'm like, that must be nice. I love to just not deal with racism on any given day. But as a salient um, identity for me, you know, I'm going to be Black 365, right? <laughs> that's, that's it. So it's not where I'm never, uh, you know, not thinking about it, working on it, challenging it. Um, so that's why we say we want to move folk from allyship and advocacy to accomplish it, you know? So being an accomplice is the, the difference between having awareness, having knowledge to, to truly just getting beyond a, a knowledge and awareness, um, a civility and a tolerance, but more to a disposition and a manner with which um, there's action and that you're working um, in step, um, in community, in, um, you know, consistency to to um, not have right rhetoric or seem right on the surface, but to right size realities for folks. So that's the difference for me around allyship mm -hmm. versus, yeah. you know, wanting to get some accomplices. And and you know, uh, there's a performative piece about allyship. I don't know if it's yeah. long before your time, but when the the idea of allies first came up, um, people would wear little buttons that said straight but not narrow and ally. And it was like, let me put a badge on that makes sure that you don't think I'm from this community, but I'm just a really good friend. <laughs> you know? and, um, and so it was, it was sort of self-protective. It took no risks other than to be considered a good person. And um, 
Yeah, so so that's that performative piece, whereas accomplices, you know, take risks as well. You know, you mm -hmm. help with the burglary, so. And I, I, yeah. You're getting locked up too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I think, you know, there's that performative piece is real. And, and it's also sort of, I think, still um, important for a lot of people who, you know, who might, uh, you know, there's a lot of people in their identity development. So I'm thinking students here in their early identity development in college that, you know, need to see those symbols and, and signs. Um, but yeah, that's, I think, you know, sort of as when we think more critically about the role of allyships, of allies, you know, we got, you know, we can easily uh, read between the lines in some cases to see, to see how, you know, how that's um, just covering up, putting a mask on, if you will, um, sort of the real problems and, and issues that drive things like heteronormativity and genderism um, that are embedded in, our, in our, some of our institutions. Mm -hmm. so we are, um, yes. Sorry, there was just one last question that I think is important. It's about uh, how to intervene, particularly for folks who are not LGBTQ, but they want to get interested. And I think there's, um, and actually, uh, Dr. Stevenson, this was part of her dissertation research, but there's a whole literature, as you know, on microaggressions. And um, Recently, I came across um, new literature on the idea of that microaggressions to counter them rather than asking people to do big things, to do micro interventions that include micro validations, micro protections, micro repairs. So you're not asking people to take huge risks from the beginning, but they're beginning to get um, accustomed to intervening so that when someone's getting ready to tell a homophobic joke that uh, the micro um, invalida validation would be to say, oh yeah, I don't find that I'm, I'm going to go over to, you know, get a drink or I'm not, I just don't, don't find that that funny, sorry, and walk away. And um, it doesn't have to be that big and this huge thing, but it's something. And as people do something, they get more empowered to do more and more. Thanks for, for addressing that question. I, I, I know, knew it was important to address and so I'm glad that you saw it and took time to, to address it. So as we wrap up, I'd like to ask uh, our speakers to, can you give us a, a elevator takeaway? Elevator ride takeaway, I know. <laughs> Elevator ride takeaway. <laughs> ah, I'd ask, I'd ask Faith and Katie and Zoe and Dodge. What, what are your takeaways? What's your elevator? <laughs> nice. <laughs> they put us on the spot here. <laughs> Turnabout is fair play. <laughs> um. I'll have to look at my notes for a minute. If anybody else would like to go first. I guess I, I had a question. I, I really wish that I could. Is it okay if I ask my question? Absolutely, yes. Um, so at the end there, we were talking about like performativeness. Um, and so like, that kind of relates to this. Um, but in terms of policies and pedagogies that aim to increase inclusivity in the classroom, um, I've seen concepts like the idea of safe space um, mm -hmm. that like originated in queer communities become like watered down and twisted um, and actually end up centering dominant identities um, and restricting LGBTQ students when it comes to like calling out microaggressions that are waged against them. Mm -hmm. um, so like, how do you see this watering down happening in other ways? And what are maybe like some pedagogies or policies that could help us avoid this sort of um, appropriation and co-option? Mm -hmm. 
That's kind of a big question. <laughs> I I was sort of <laughs> like, ooh, where she, where, lots of great places to go. But um, mm -hmm. and one of the things probably, Katie, I would say to you is that um, you know people of color have discovered all along that safe space never meant safe for them. Mm -hmm. It meant keep things polite. Uh, and and you know so then people try to find brave space or uh, spaces to take risks in or spaces to for discomfort or challenge and and yeah it's intentionality rather than the naming. Yeah. Well I, it is a, it is a big question. I mean, I, I'll just say briefly. It makes me think of. I think Diva mentioned this in one of her comments earlier um, about. I I tie it back to sort of the purpose of education, and we, you know, I you know, how can we think in more liberatory, think toward more liberatory purposes in what we do and how we do it in on college campuses, both in the classroom and out of the classroom. So, um, I think the more we we sort of lead with that purpose in mind of purpose of liberation, the more we're um, going to sort of break down um, you know, some of the performative types of roles that we often, often find ourselves in. Students, I don't have anything yeah. to add. I don't have anything to add. I, I think my colleagues, they, they said, um, enough said. Yes, thank you very much. I would agree with that. Students, do you have a takeaway that you'd like to share? You can pass if you want to. You can skip if you want to. But we'd love to hear from you. I have one now. Um, I think it's really inspiring to know that there is so much more inspiring and daunting to know that there's so much more to study. But I think the coolest part about the queer community and the LGBTQ community is that it's always about the imagination and like imagining different ways to connect with people in different terms, to describe those relationships. And I think it's really cool to see that there's space for academia in that because I think a lot of, at least like a lot of what I've learned is from either like my community, the people I'm around or the internet in like social media. Um, and so, yeah, I'm really grateful that you are all able to be here and talk to us about this because I think right now, especially, um, it can be hard to imagine what the future will look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that, that's, what, that's my take. I think that was very well said, Faith. Thank you for saying that. Um, and I just, I don't have much to add aside from like um, just kind of reiterating a little bit about um, the hope in that, um, that that really helps me to be more optimistic um, and realizing that there is a whole community working on these issues and thinking about these issues all the time. Um, and that that's very <laughs> helpful for me. So thank you. I would say um, in the spirit of multiplicity and not trying to like pin the, pin the like the takeaway down to one thing, I would say one thing that I got. Um, it's just like, I, I think in a similar vein to Katie and Faith, um, I think part of me, it's sort of like written off academia as like a space for potential liberation. Um, so it's, it's really hopeful to see that this is being thought about in such intentional ways and that like redesigning and reimagining like is possible. Oh, yeah, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I would just want to agree 100% with what Faith and Katie and Dodge just said. Um, it's just, I don't know, it's really enlightening and hopeful to look at academia as somewhere where um, LGBTQIA students can be validated and our experiences can be used to help one another. So thank you. Thank you students. Thank you to this panel. 
Thank you to everyone who made tonight's e event, special event, it's special to me and nothing special to many of us who are here. Uh, this, this to our time together possible, including the BW Bastion Foundation, the Westminster College Campus Community, the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, our student moderators from Queer Compass, and especially our speakers, my mentors, my academic family. I felt like I was back in the Porter Building on the Eastern Michigan University campus. And to just, for the, for the world to be able to see what I got to see up close. And it's just amazing. And I'm, I'm so proud to be a part of this. And I wanna do my part to, to uh, elevate this work, elevate this conversation and, and use the scholarly gifts and talents and skills that I learned to be able to do what you all are doing. I'm still a teachable, I'm still, I still learn from you. And I, I love that our students are even encouraged by this. This just lets us know this is, we cannot stop here. We have to continue with this. And so uh, please take a moment to complete the survey in the chat so we can find out what we're doing well and what we can improve on. Our next Bastion Diversity Lecture Series event will take place in January, 2021 with our Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Commemorative Series. So let's continue to learn from the past, listen in the present so we can live in a better future. Thank you all for being here tonight. Have a great evening. Thank you all. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you very much, yeah. Thank you so much. And the future is yours. It is yes. yours. Amen to that. Thank you so much. Don't forget to vote.